like going crazy, uh, a lot of us are stuck working remotely. Um, we're either homeschooling our families or we're working at, at our jobs with no colleagues, no managers, uh, no like structure. And many of the people that I've worked with are struggling. You know, they're procrastinating. They are, you know, dipping into anxiety, falling into depression, and really starting to get things done and feel productive. Uh, Adi, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you have to say about working with home? Sure. I've been working from home for uh, five to six weeks now and certainly learned a lot. I am a clinical psychologist in New York and I work mainly in group therapy setting. So I learned a lot from my colleagues, from my own experience and from my patients about how to manage this really weird time in which we're unexpectedly have to change all our schedules, all our routine and find ways to take care of ourselves and others effectively. Yeah, what do you see people really struggling with out there? So I think one thing that's coming up is a lot of isolation and a sense of loss of control of your schedule and the things that you're supposed to do. People are feeling really unhinged and the things that have managed their their step-by-step -step day are taken away. It might be as simple as the commute to work because that's a separation from home between home and work. And that facilitates kind of getting into a different state of mind and preparing you to your workday. And then within the workday, you might have not noticed it when you were in the office or wh whatever setting you were working at, that you have scheduled things that you don't have to schedule. In my particular work, my groups are scheduled by the clinic. And so I have to get up from my computer, go to a group room, run the group, and then come back. Those little steps that I was taking were facilitating my sense of pace and rhythm, and they gave me a structure. And now that is taken away. And that can be extremely confusing. And people don't really think about that. They don't quite understand why. Now I don't have to commute. That's great. I just earned half an hour, an hour, maybe more of the day. Why am I not feeling more productive? Why are actually things taking me longer? And the reason, at least part of the reason, is that you're not prepared to do them. Those little segments of the day that, um, that were between one activity and the other prepared you for whatever it is you needed to do. Yeah, you know, some things we want to talk about were routine, schedule, and self-care. And what I'm hearing you talk about is that routine piece, right? The part, those little predictable things that get us into the mood and prepare us to do the work that we want to do. That's right. And I'm also thinking about how to structure it. So when you talk about schedule, a schedule is something that we are able to structure for ourselves so that the routine will just kind of link into that and, and work with that in a way that helps us feel productive. Because I think part of the difficulty, and that ties to self-care, is that when we don't feel productive, we don't feel competent, it chips at our sense of self. And then we might experience all sorts of emotions that will make it harder for us to engage effectively. We feel a little depressed or a little blue. We might have increased anxiety because we're not meeting deadlines or we don't exactly know what's supposed to happen next. And that kind of confusion will make it a little harder um, to engage. So we're going to talk about self-care as well. So do you want to say anything about those schedules that yeah. can help us so much? I get a couple of things. I think the first thing on routine, there's an adage that I like to use with a lot of my clients and frankly with myself is that discipline creates freedom. You know, oftentimes when people are working from home, they're like, oh, I get to be free. I get to hang out. I get to like, you know, play with my dog. I get to eat cookies all day. You know, I can sleep in a little bit. And what that ultimately does is leave people feeling trapped and feeling imprisoned. Um, without mm -hmm. those disciplines, without those, you know, routines, the mind can really just like fray, for lack of a better word. You know, time can start to slip away. Some people listening may be experiencing that where, you know, the days start to blur together. Um, motivation seems to be at an all time low. Things like procrastination can creep back up. You know, sleep quality is way down. You know, that it's those disciplines that are very helpful. Um, and there's a ton of literature out there on how to create, you know, routines, but a really common one is the idea of a morning routine, you know, where you're waking up at the same time every day. You are doing something for self care, whether it be meditation or maybe a little bit of exercise, you know, or some stretching. Um, you try to uh, streamline what you're eating. So maybe you have the same cup of coffee or the same meal. You know, the idea is to actually remove choice, but to create a program that you can execute, that you kind of go through at a same practice practice pace. And 
paradoxically, that allows the mind to relax because all those decisions are offloaded and you can actually be more present in your life uh, knowing that you're going through that routine. I love what you're saying. I love it because research have shown that when the mind is left to its own device, the go-to is to the negative. Mm -hmm. Minds that are just free floating, they go to what's dangerous, what's problematic, what needs to be fixed, which is adaptive. As human being, we want to identify those problems and solve them. However, as human beings, we also then look for them when there isn't a problem. So I love what you're saying. If we are disciplining ourselves to a, a schedule that makes sense, that will free the mind to not look for problems where there aren't any, to not kind of feel lost and then go into some daydreaming and kind of be stuck in the past or obsess about the future in ways that actually don't create any actions, any behaviors that promote our goals and, and help us live by our values. So I love what you're saying. And I think one thing that I notice, and this is just like, that's what I do. It's not that you need to do that. I make my bed. I don't make it necessarily in the exact same time. I make my bed before I start working. So when I start working, my bed is made. And I can see my bed from um, what I now use as an office. And that soothes me. That freedom is there for me because I've done something right. Something is organized. It's pleasing to the eye. So for me, that, that is scheduled for me sometimes in the morning. It is my routine. And it is an act of self-care because it lowers my anxiety and it makes me feel also it's kind of like a, um, a little ceremony that I do that says, now you're going to work. This, this um, environment is now a work environment, not your sleep environment. Um, so just really like what you're saying about those structures. And it's different for everyone. If you, your structure and, and your schedule will be dictated sometimes by what the environment is demanding from you. Maybe you have children, or maybe you have a pet that needs to be walked, or maybe you have a partner and you have some kind of back and forth that creates a routine for the two of you or how many partners you have it's it's different for each person so i think one concrete thing that you can do is to look at the amount of time that you have what is your schedule like when do you have to be at work when is your first typical meeting or when did you typically walk into the office and start reading your emails or starting engaging with others whatever it is that marked the start of your day Mark it for yourself and then work backwards. When do I need to wake up in order to, um, to schedule something throughout the morning that puts me in a state of mind of now I'm going to be a productive employee or whatever, you might be independent. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm going to build on that a little bit as far as scheduling goes. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs or a lot of people that run startups where you know, either they run a small company or they work from home all the time and they have a lot of flexibility. And kind of what you were saying earlier, they don't have a boss or a higher up telling them when to be and where. They often have to make a lot of the structure by themselves. So one uh, activity that I help people do as they're beginning this process is something called a block schedule. So in a block schedule, the way to set that up is essentially what you do is you list out all the different roles that you play. I think this is especially pressing now, right? Because many people have many different hats, you know, their employees, right? They are parents, they are lovers, you know, they are athletes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they might have different things within their job. They might be doing marketing, they might be doing admin, they might be doing something clinical for the mental health field. There's a lot of different roles. So once you block out all those roles, right, the idea is to think about strategically, similar to what you're saying, how many hours a week you'd like to spend on each of those roles. Mm -hmm. And then put those in blocks in your calendar, right? Mm -hmm. So that you know, like, hey, you know, this marketing thing, not really my priority, but I need to spend at least two hours a week on marketing. You know, clinical, that's where the money comes from for me. So I need to be spending at least 15 hours a week on clinical and being able to block that out. Um, that technique goes a little bit further by creating a separate to-do list for every block. So the idea is, you know, you're not controlled by what to do when, because many people, especially early on, they don't like that feeling, but you get a menu when you're in there. So you're like, okay, now I'm wearing my marketing hat. I can go to my marketing list and do the things out, off of that list. And I can do anything I want as long as it's on that list. Similarly for when I'm a parent, when I'm you know, exercising, um, when I'm working, things like that. 
I, I really liked it and it kind of brought up this, this, I, this there's like a, a technique to help people when they are worrying a lot called worry time. And that mm -hmm. means that you're going to schedule a time to worry. Now, that's not what I'm suggesting right now. We can talk about it in some other time. What I'm thinking is you're talking about these, these kind of roles and the different things, the different to-do list for each role is that what happens to a lot of people is that you sit down and suddenly all those tasks for the other roles, for the other parts of yourself are coming up. And then people have a strong urge a strong urge to get up and do that other thing. That's why people clean so much because they have a test to study for. Like they suddenly cook so much because all those other tasks that are connected to another part of the self are suddenly really, really pending. Part of discipline is to say, well, right now I am not a mom or right now I am not a marketer. Right now I am a clinical psychologist and I am listening to someone. And reminding the mind that we can kind of tether them back, tether the mind back um, to this moment. The way you can do that, that's really not that easy to do. That urge is very strong. So what you can do is just have a pad or if you're more electronically inclined, you can take like your phone and write down, have a list, that to-do list for each of the role and write it down. Because when you do those block times, you will know, I don't have to do this right now. I don't have to stop my activity to go to another activity. That habit is problematic because then you'll have a lot of unfinished tasks and you will feel more frazzled. You might have feelings of guilt and confusion. You'll feel less organized. And what, Mark, what you brought up in the beginning, that less freedom, that less sense of kind of expensive, um, I'll, I'll use it again, freedom, will be taken away rather than increased. So I want to really suggest that as a complementary to what you were saying, if other roles are coming to mind, you don't need to ignore them because they might come louder. Tell them, yes, I know I'm going to put it down like that part of yourself that's pulling you and I'm going to do it in worry time or mom time or, you know, marketing time, whatever it is that is that role that is coming up for you. Yeah, I love that. I feel like every time we talk, we could do a million different topics. And I know. I, like, I, I think that the not to do list is really important. You know, mm -hmm. um, it just makes me associate to something that a hard truth I had to learn, you know, a couple of years ago, which is that multitasking is a myth. I used to think I was really good at multitasking and I could do a million things at once and I could like, you know, be on the computer and be doing work and watching TV and like I just taking all this information. But really, I just was awful at all those things. Yes. And, you know, developing that focus and developing that ability to really just do one thing at a time. I know for me, and I would assume for you, it connects to mindfulness practice, connects to, yeah. you know, self-care, self-love, um, discipline, the ability to actually drill into something and, you know, feel all the feelings that come with that, you know? Well, mm -hmm. I noticed when I was multitasking, what I was really doing is I was insulating myself from the difficult feelings of doing something hard. You know, feeling right. like I was dumb or feeling like I was incompetent or feeling confused. If I had a exactly. lot of stuff coming in, I didn't have to feel that. But then I didn't I didn't do anything. <laughs> you know, I also, didn't, I also didn't accomplish anything. I love that you're saying that because it's exactly what happened. When that other role is coming in, it's going to to save you from the fact that the role that you're in right now is hard. And maybe you're not sure of what you're supposed to do or you're not sure you're doing it well. So that other role is, is like a savior that comes and takes you away. But what actually is going to happen is you'll never... Uh, uh, build enough mastery to be comfortable in each role at a time. Um, so I love what you're saying, and I think it's it's spot on. And I like that you brought in the self care because I don't want to miss that part in this conversation that we're having. Um, I do want to kind of like recap a little bit. What we're telling our viewers to do is to really build a schedule that is predictable and known, um, that takes into account the different aspects of your life that needs to be addressed um, and really know when you're going to address each of them and then to build a routine that you know you know what's what it's going to look like for you to move from one task to another um, just another tip on that on the routine um, if you can not all of us can if you can have different spots in the house and it could be literally like a foot and a half away like moving your body to a different position, a different place. If there is something that you can do by a desk, or maybe, I don't know, some people had moved their desk such that they can be on 
two sides of the desk rather than by a wall, even that will create a routine. Now I'm entering that other role that I earlier were able not was able not to kind of like engage with impulsively. Um, and I want to I want to see if we can tie all of this to the self care piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's then. do it. Let's do it. What are your thoughts on self-care? I think that is part of the schedule and the routine. I think people forget, and especially if you have to take care of other people. Um, if you have to take care of, of maybe a sick parent or somebody elderly in your family, or maybe a partner who is having their own thoughts, feelings, and, and behaviors in this. And especially if you're a parent, my heart goes to all parents right now because it is hard. Um, most people who are parenting kids right now are struggling in one way, one way or another. So taking care of the self can feel really not that important right now, or I don't have time for this. Um, it might come with some guilt or shame about what you're not doing. So I think self-care can be, um, you can be disciplined about that too, using everything we talked about in terms of work day. Schedule that time. That is one role. Taking care of self is a role, is one of those roles that we, we talked about and block some time for that. And have a routine. What does it mean for you to to have some self-care. Does it mean that you get to shower every day? Does it mean that you get to shower in the morning or in the evening? What is it for you that makes you feel a little nourished, have a little bit of time for yourself? We're all so different in the way that we feel sustained and taken care of. Some of us need alone time. Some of us really need to connect to a particular individual. Um, some of us need to be with a pet. Some of us need to be outdoors and others need to exercise. It's just different. Um, and self-care, I want to say one thing that's important. Self-care is different than self-indulgent or self-pity. Those are different things. Self-care means a little bit of discipline as well. And sometimes doing something that might be a little hard for you to do, either emotionally or physically, because you're going to reap some benefits. Um, for example, you might indulge in eating a pint of ice cream for dinner every day. And, you know, for a couple of days, it might be self-care. I'm not going to like... I'm not gonna like talk down on eating ice cream for dinner because I I would do that sometimes. If you do that every night, now it's self-indulgent and you're actually not taking care of yourself. Perhaps getting some fresh vegetables and or whatever it is that, that is nourishing for you. I'm not, people diets is different. And eating something that actually makes you feel good and you feel nourished by it might be better. So pay attention to those differences and be really nice to yourself. There's no need to criticize yourself if you did eat ice cream for dinner for even a week or two, whatever. That that already happened. It's in the past. That was probably at least elements of it were self-care. And give yourself prop for being kind to yourself and maybe um, spoiling yourself a little. And then think, what would make me feel really good? What will make me feel that that I have what my heart and my mind and my body needs in order to cope with all of this? Yeah, I, I love all what you're saying. I'm going to reframe it in some other ways because I think we have a lot of the same views on that. You know, mm -hmm. I think essentially what I liked about your saying is like this idea of tracking what it actually helps you and what doesn't. You know, from my background as an addictions counselor, you know, I work mm -hmm. with a lot of people who are on the self indulgent side or who are on the hedonistic side where they think that things that are very pleasurable, even though they might feel good in the moment, might lead to detrimental effects down the line. So whether that be using substances or, you know, like you said, overindulging in food or, you know, sleeping all day, um, you know, something like that, it, it actually can drain us over time. Um, one way that I to, like to look at is probably to protect, you know, fragile male ego, because I work mostly with men, mostly with male business owners. And they don't like the term self-care. They think that self-care is like some kind of like weak term. So we have an answer for that. Uh, the term that I use is protect the asset or sharpen the blade, which is the idea that, and I think especially in the mental health industry, but I think in many industries too, we are the tool, right? Mm -hmm. We are the tool. And especially uh, I think in parenting, right? Like if we're, you know, if I'm a father, if you're a mother, we are the tool, we are the instrument. And if yes. it's difficult to, to think about taking care of yourself for that, think about taking care of yourself so you can do a better job for the people that you love or for the work that you've committed to. You know, if, if, you're, if your blade, if your knife is dull, right? You can't cut anything, right? If your acid is compromised, you can't be effective in the world. So it's this idea of like kind of individuation and uh, living adulthood, 
we learn how to take care of ourselves and actually set ourselves up for success. You know, we, we try to stack our deck with the best cards possible. So every time we draw a new hand, we have the best cards to play every single day. And that's way easier said than done, but that metaphor tends to help a lot of the guys that I work with. That's, that's wonderful. I really love it. And it makes me think of a story. I wish I could give credit, but I don't remember who told me the story and in what context. If any of the viewers know this, please put it in the comments because um, I, I like to give credit. It's this woman. Um, she is an ultra-Orthodox woman. And in that community, you tend to have many children. And I don't know how many, but she had a lot of children. And she the only place where she could be alone was in the laundry room. So sometimes she would go to the laundry room and she would lock the door. And if the kids would knock on the door, I'd be like, mom, what are you doing? She would say, I'm making you a mom, which yeah. I think is so beautiful. She was taking a little bit of time of not being with the kids so that she can be the best mom when she steps out of the laundry room. And I, I think it's, it's, a, it's kind of a mirror of what you were saying. Sharpen the knife, protect your asset, be be the best you that you can be for all the other things that you're supposed to do. Um, I love that. I think it's a beautiful way of, of kind of allowing people to do something for themselves without feeling that they're weak or that they're guilty of something, um, which definitely is in the way of, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to say self-care. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it is. And, it, and it, people feel like it's indulgent or selfish comes up a lot. We're like, I don't want to be selfish. And it's like you're actually contributing to the things that you do care about and the people that are in your life because you mm -hmm. can show up in a more present and healthy way for them. It's all connected. It's not separate. Self-care is part of this whole routine and scheduling process. Yeah, I'll give one more tip, um, and I guess we'll we'll be reaching the end soon. One thing that might help you um, do all this self-care acts is you are teaching, especially if you're a parent, you're teaching your children that they are important. Sometimes parents are mistaken to think that if they just put the kid as top priority at all costs, the child will feel important. That's not accurate. Sometimes we teach others that self-importance is a value because we show them that we care about ourselves. And we show them that it's okay to separate for a little bit from the people we love so that we can take care of ourselves. And that will give them permission. Saying no to a child gives them this internal sense of what is a no and then they can say no when it's right for them and i think most of us want that for our children we want our children to be allowed to take a minute um, to say no to something they don't want to commit to or they don't want to participate in we want that language to be a part of their vocabulary and teaching by example is the best way so maybe that will help um, some people to reframe for themselves that permission to, to take care of themselves and do something for themselves as a preparation to, uh, to be ready for all the other things that are on their plate. Absolutely. Well, it's been great talking. Uh, for those listening, please let us know if there's anything in the comments that you'd like us to talk more about, any questions that were left unanswered. Um, we talked about schedule. We talked about routine. We talked about self-care. If you'd like some more tips on that, book recommendations, just let us know. We are a wealth of information. And we'd love to have any feedback on how this is going. We know we're piloting this new format. And I'd love to hear how the interview format works. And if you're interested in hearing more about how to work from home. So I'm Mark Azoulay. This is the DOVV, and we are signing off. All right. See you soon, Bye. guys.